Welcome to episode nine of the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. I'm your host, Tony Suriano. Get ready for some audio gear talk, career transition talk, and some sound speed. This podcast will talk you through the ups and downs in the entertainment industry. Each and every one of you has a talent, but it's a tough business. People gonna tell you, get a real job. By introducing you to sustainable, moldable methods in a crazy, cutthroat world. Let us harness our willpower and take real action. Don't let it get you down. Join me, brothers and sisters, on a journey through trials and tribulations. Unfake it till you make it. Do you love sound? Do you love music? I do. And in this episode... It's all about sound in the entertainment industry. I talk with a guy I call my brother-in-law, because he is, who struggled and pushed as a production assistant on film sets in Los Angeles for some years until transitioning into a career of sound, establishing himself in New Orleans. He is a professional audio mixer for TV and film with a huge musical background. We talk shop and talk about how he stayed humble through the entry-level gigs while steadily climbing the ladder closer to his passions. With no more intro, here he is, the one and only B.A.D. bad Mr. Blake Allen Donabauer. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Oh, I hear you. Uh, dude, I don't know why my iPad's not... Like, I heard the same ringing sounds mm. and the same, like, application sounds for it, the app, but it, it just, you couldn't hear me. I don't huh. know. So, any, anyways, I'm here now. Sorry <laughs> about that. Good. No, that's good. It's the, the tech stuff that happens. How's the morning? Oh, uh, it's been good, you know, besides just getting off a, um, you know, pretty long day yesterday on this project and um yeah kind of like low budget Mm. scripted web project about transgender stuff so it was Hmm. kind of a labor of love type thing ended up being like a 16 hour day instead of a 10 hour day um yesterday but (laughs) you know it's part of the process yeah it just is what it is hey let me ask you a a quick audio question about how i'm recording uh because i have i have my zoom and i have my output going straight in um, and it seems to be working great, but I've always done the levels between negative twelve and negative six. Is that still like a good standard to record at? In most um, devices like Zooms, it's, it, the zero dB is actually like negative twenty. Really? When you it, it, I, when you pull it into like Premiere, it's mm-hmm. like padded a little bit. Yeah. To where you can pull it up, but yeah, I think the, the industry standard for me for independent tracks is like negative eight. Oh. You know, negative six, and then and then I'll try to do like zero, um, or as close to you know like negative four to zero on my mix tracks. Ah, uh, okay. So right now, if I if I'm actually like close on my highest point, I'm at negative six. Is that is that pretty good to keep it at? That, I mean, yeah, it's fine. You're not hitting any yellow yet at all. Okay, great. That I just yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I figured. Yeah, cool. you can boost and edit all that. You sound good though. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm so right now I'm actually. The, I think you're hearing the mic on the Mac, but I am recording with a Sennheiser directly into the Zoom. So, and then great. there's a separate, which is great. What what mic are you recording on? Or just... I'm using my headset oh, now okay. that I've so. gone through the process this morning. <laughs> I was trying to get the uh, interface to work with the new computers uh-huh. and find the driver, and then I couldn't find the driver because the interface, you know, was ten years old. Yeah. And then I got the iPad out and got all of it set up in the audio issue. And then uh, we're on the third device this morning. Isn't, so. that, isn't that funny how that's how it is? It's like exactly how sometimes on set. It's, it's just always, there's always something, nothing. You're, you should be able just to push a button and mm-hmm. uh, it, it worked, but it, it usually doesn't. <laughs> yeah. But actually you sound very, very clear, crisp. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, excellent. No, they're they're Bose. They're a Bose headset system. These are oh, what, nice. What I, I bought a couple pair of these for my utilities and boom operators because they keep your ears from getting sweaty. But um, kind wow. of the low end and the hue of everything is really nice. Hmm, that's great. Uh, well, yeah. While you brought that up, I might as well. I mean, are you loving those earphones? Yeah, and I what, am. Uh, what for, are they exactly? Not not. not not for mixing exactly, okay. um, because they have a little bit too much of a of a bass frequency that send off. But when you're 
uh, a utility and running around or, you know, needing to make adjustments, listening to somebody give you directions or listening to talent say, hey, my mic fell off and things of that nature. If, you, if you're running and gunning, they're a nifty thing to have. And I use them a lot. Uh, now on set for myself, I'll end up carrying like an IFB unit on my waist even if I'm sitting at my car and I have these hanging from my neck and if I have to walk away from my cart or, hmm. um, you know, go ask script, the scripty a question, uh, scripty being script supervisor for people who don't know, okay. uh, about labeling and the next thing coming up or how the slate's looking, um, and have to walk away. I can, you know, let my team know they do their thing, but I'm also able to put on these Bose headphones as I walk away. Hmm. With my IFB, and I can hear, you know, if they're like, all right, in your places, then I have to run back to my cart as quickly as possible, or I can tell if I have time to go to the restroom and all that kind of good stuff. Hmm. So they've, they, or, you know, uh, I've especially used them as like a workbench when I've had to resolder and fix some cables and some things on the fly. Hmm. I can kind of take off my main headphones and not be so sweaty and feel like I'm in a, um, you know, like a, this, like a dark room, essentially. I see. Uh, with my ears and let my ears breathe a little bit because they don't go completely into your ears or completely cover your ears. Wow. And yeah. then, so those are Bose earphones. What's the, what was the make on them? Or? I'm going to look up the make on these guys real quick. I'll find, I got that for you in just a second. Cool. The, the killer. Looks like these are all is one word, Bose Sound Sport. And they like they have these little rubber cups that fit on the inside of your ear. They're very nice. They just have like, you know, Bose things are a little bit more on the low end as far as their sound capabilities are more bassy. Mm -hmm. um, these have like, for not going all the way in your ear in cloud, these, I mean, actually allow people to talk to you while you're wearing them and they're not plugging any part of your ear, which is fantastic. Mm. It has volume control levels there, which that doesn't necessarily, the microphone doesn't work with IFBs on set and whatnot, but you have, you know, Nice. toggles on top of those devices to turn up and down of, uh, as needed when you're in conversation but yeah i use these a lot for my guys and, and they're easy to clean the rubber pieces come off you can clean them in alcohol and um, they sound better than you know any other earbud out there nice that's actually i should look into that because um and now you're using them you, do you uh, use use them sometimes to take calls just like this like let's say you're in the car as well oh yeah absolutely oh, great because yeah because i need some new ones like they all i feel like well, I always get the cheap ones, but they always start to die and get less and less of the sound, and they start falling apart. It's just always yeah. The, these you can actually order like all the new pieces for it. Pretty wow. Much. Um, and they make they make older models that were sound sport that don't have the microphone built into them. Um, that were just old headphones. I had a pair of those, and that's how I kind of got turned on to these. Cool. Oh yeah. Back in the the olden days, before we talked on microphones connected to headphones <laughs> through our cell phones. Yeah. So, uh, hey, I have a funny, I mean, this internet's amazing, obviously, and uh, we're talking through the internet. So I have an internet uh, thing that I found, something interesting about you that I found on the internet in 2011. Oh. <laughs> six, interesting. Yeah, six years ago, you uploaded a single video to YouTube. Do you remember what it was? I don't even think that was me. I believe that was your sister, my wife, <laughs> uh, uploaded that under my account. I believe it was the... Do you realize song of the Flaming Lips concert? Good memory. Uh, at uh, the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and they were doing the, a tribute to the Wizard of Oz in between their sets. It was a wacky, weird night. <laughs> I think the uh, the the Johnny Ramone um, memorial had like a disco ball shooting laser beams hanging from it. I mean, it was it was crazy. Okay, good. Yeah, I was wondering if you remembered that. So that's funny you didn't post it. Yeah. I was wondering what now, what story was behind that, like if there was any. <laughs> I've I've never been one to post much of anything I ever did. I mean, I kind of uh, as I was doing a lot of music, uh, and getting out of college. That's when like Facebook and people posting their own videos and things of that nature became kind of popular. And I was mm -hmm. um, already trying to make a make a dollar out in the, in, in the blue collar world. So yeah, I just never really got into posting anything. I don't know why. There's there's tons of. Uh, audio and video footage of bands mm -hmm. and projects and things that I have stored on hard drives and everything, but I've never really shared all that information on the internet. What, what is your relationship to sound and just in general? What, what, what do wow. you have? My relationship with sound. 
That's a great question. I mean, it's it's a it's a fickle relationship I have with sound um, mm-hmm. because my my love for sound inherently comes from music and in particularly the vibration of strings and the vibration of wood on guitars um, is what sound was to me for such a long time. And at one point in my life, I feel like I was uh, maybe a little obsessive with that component, you know, a lot of open tuning guitar stuff and really loud uh, khaki king sort of rhythmic stuff. And then you learn, you know, African percussions and things of that nature. And that was my relationship with sound. And now it's fickle. It's, my relationship is my work life with sound now, which is listening for inconsistencies and diagnosing trouble um, as fastly as possible and even foreseeing it before any hiccups arise. Um, so sound so sound now kind of keeps me awake and uh, very busy and I'm it's it's a pleasure that I, I do experience. It's just not the same pleasure that comes from the point in my life where music was engulfing me. The origins. Hmm. Yes. Do you find yourself, now that you've been very experienced with sound on set, like you said, um, and finding stuff before it happens, when you're off set, do you sometimes like start to notice the minute things in sound that others don't? <laughs> Does it bother you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try not to let that come into play. I mean, it comes in the minute sound conversation happens on set at least once every show. And it's usually with somebody I become friendly with, with like an AD or a script supervisor who communicate with me often as a mixer. Uh, just noticing after listening to multiple sets or being on the same location all day, somebody will say something to me, but me personally, um, yeah, I notice it at home. There'll be, you know, I've got a two and a half year old almost and a one year old and, uh, We'll have two children's programs on two different TVs while my wife is on a FaceTime call with um, her mother, your mother. Uh, you know, and it's just a multitude of things that are going. The beeper on the you know, microwave might be going off at the same time, or the refrigerator's not shut and has a beep to it, too. And I'm just looking around going, What the hell's going on? Excuse my French. But what the hell's going on? You know, like, why is there so much noise going on here? Like, you you try to, and then you look to the right and you're like, you grab, you, you try a, to grab your boom and you're like, wait, I'm not on set. Uh, uh, my first thought is to build like an incubated, you know, sound booth, but uh, there's no hope with these monkeys running around. <laughs> That's funny. Mm. Okay. Why is sound so important in filmmaking? I would almost say it's more than half of the process. I mean, some something could absolutely look like shit um excuse my french there too are we allowed to cuss yeah yeah totally you can say figgity fuck fuck i'm figgity fuck fuck yes start there as i'm lighting up my cigarette here um and i got off base remind me what we were talking about oh yes uh you were saying something i really completely agree with where if your picture looks shitty you can actually have really quality sound and get away with more or actually follow the story Right. Better. Um, yeah, I think you can, follow, you can get away with something being consistent in a shot or some, uh, you know, edits that I've seen. You can, you know, have some uh, continuity issues with what you see on camera from one cut to the next. But if you have audio issues um, on a scene, especially that is the favorite of said director, um, you know, it, it, could, it be, could become an issue. I think it's it's funny and not funny, but... On set, sometimes I, the cameraman, I mean the DP, director of photography, I think, I feel at least, like you were just saying, maybe even more sound is more important. And I, I, I really agree with that. But a lot of people don't, somehow they don't see it like that on set. You know what I mean? No, yeah, and, and there's, a, there's a, honestly, there's a cackling quiet that goes on on set it's almost like going to a movie itself where you hear everybody rattling the bags of popcorn and opening their candy hmm. i don't understand but it seems like a lot of people that work on set when we call roll and we do quiet on set ring the bell whatever needs to happen the red light is lit um there's always somebody who's whispering that thinks they can't be heard or you know something along those lines and it's it's just amusing to me how much of that goes on even in a in 
an extremely controlled environment and how much work you have to do to keep that controlled. Um, but it's epically important to the final product of the film. And if you don't capture um, everything that's going on, notice everything that's going on in between lines, make sure things are delivered cleanly, make sure that you have room tone if there is some kind of droning noise. Um, I mean, it all comes into play in the edit bay. And the more that you can notate and relate to the editor, um, the better their process is going to be in picking out the good audio clips versus the bad, or, or at least knowing what your procedure was and how to, you know, backlog your mix to your ISOs and everything else that you've left them. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's very important. Um, and it doesn't seem like it is sometimes the directors and p the creatives get lost into their own vision and what needs to be done next. And they're working on a time frame and they need to push, um, and things get lost in audio. Unfortunately, is like one of those things that gets pushed and forgotten about, but it, but when it comes down to editing and putting the final product together, it's it's up there. Yeah, you have to be the ninja that gets everything with people not even uh, being aware, right? Because once you make a mistake, they they start. Then they focus. Oh, sound! <laughs> it's so important. Yeah, and it's always two weeks later after <laughs> the day that that event happened. You know that you get an email and mm -hmm. I have to backtrack with things. But hopefully, you're on a project that's long enough that allows you. Um, a chance to get wild lines or redo some things. Um, How do you describe wild lines? Uh, wild lines are just having the dialogue deliver the uh, as perfectly and as exact in the same way as possible off camera, um, straight into the microphone, um, as clean and quiet as possible. And that, uh, that's and this, when you're on set. That's not uh, like an ADR session offset, it, right? No, this this should save money and not having to do ADR if it's quiet enough and the performance by the actor or actress is portrayed as well as it was on camera, then there shouldn't be a problem and these things could be able to be inserted inserted and used um, hopefully in an advantageous way to where they don't have to spend money and bring in the talent for an ADR session because I know that's got to be very expensive. Yeah, and a hassle, I think. <coughs> Uh, Absolutely. Did you know about the Robert Rodriguez film? Uh, what's the original? El Mariachi? That they did literally was like, shoot it, wild track. Shoot it, wild track. <laughs> because they didn't have the proper stuff. That's how they shot no, most I, of the whole film. <laughs> I mean, at least they were smart enough to know that that's part yeah. of the process. Yeah, and it, oh, that film is classic now. It's crazy. Well, you know, sometimes if you if you get a director with that in mind, then it's a lot of fun to do something like that. I, I, I wish I could work on an action film or a sci-fi horror film that would shoot like that, where it was just guns going off and things are crazy and nothing's usable and you have to catch whatever you can in the moment. I mean, I, I know that films such as, you know, Star Wars, things of that nature, as far as getting like feet running in sand and all kinds of different heights and things that they're wanting sounds of they usually have two or three boom operators running around for the mixer you know capturing multiple things at a time hmm. um it's quite the spectacle it's cool <laughs> i haven't yeah i've never thought about that you know we always know oh man we're doing an action scene let's have three cameras five cameras but for audio that's interesting to have five five booms or three booms flying around Hmm. Yeah, you, know, you can make that happen, though. You know, you've got to have the right team and the right guidance and the right game plan in place, and have time to actually get that conveyed over and make it work. But it, I, I have seen it done. I've seen it done on TV shows, um, series for Netflix and Hulu that I've been diving in and out on um, here, where they've used multiple booms wow. and play, and it it, it works beautifully um, for a lot of things, except for you know, steady cam shots through an entire house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's hard. Actually, since you mentioned that, when there is a steady cam, and let's just say you're boom operating, because I, I know you're mainly doing mixing and stuff right now, and you have your own boom operator. But what is the boom operator? How does he master that? If it's a, a steady cam shot and the guy has lines, and you have to walk with him, and I mean, you have to have what silent feet? Yeah, I mean, it's a hard thing. You can do those little booties that slide over. Um, you can try to lay some mats down. If if at all possible, but if you end up having um, the steady cam operator along with the first AD, along with the focus puller, 
along with the boom operator, all walking backwards, let's say, <laughs> coming in, you're going, you're going to hear the feet. Um, and that's, a, that's a good time. You know, you, that's why you also wire and don't depend on your boom operator too at that point, because hopefully there's enough distance between your talent and what's the, what the camera's seeing to where it makes sense or to where the microphone's hugging the body so tight that you're not necessarily bleeding those, those feet hitting the floor and it's up high enough off the floor. It's not yeah. bleeding in so bad. Whereas the boom, the boom's facing the floor. It's going to pick all that kind of stuff off. And then you're just doing uh, the boom. At, I mean, technically for, it would be a backup. backup or if you get, if some reason it just happens to sound better then they would use it. Absolutely. Okay. You give them the option. Yeah. Nice. Hmm. Cool. Okay. So now, nowadays you've been, you've been mixing on like some really good TV shows a lot and that's, uh, that's your audio mark right now. But can we go back to some years ago when you graduated from, uh, Berkeley school of music? That's what they call it, right? Yeah. Berkeley college of music. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, that's a really top music school in the United States. What was the what was your major? Uh, songwriting. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, I actually majored in songwriting, and I, I don't do much of that these days. But yeah, I focused in on the process of writing and then delivering that writing. You know, when, when you were doing songwriting, was were you also recording the songs yourself then? And how did that go? Yeah, I mean there was. Um, Berkeley is a, an adventurous place, so you have a lot of crossing over. You had a lot of engineers that were in the production engineering prog- program that would you know, grab songwriters and bands from the school and use them as their recording projects. So I had you know, some experiences um, in the studio as the musician getting recorded, um, playing pr- you know, associate producer, let's say, um, while somebody else's project for their recordings classes um but i also um the way that berkeley does its education is quite brilliant and the electives that are around are very nice so i I got i didn't even decide on songwriting being my um main focus until my junior year there and before that they had a program called just a, a, a bachelor's degree of professional music which was a combination of multiple things including music business songwriting um film scoring, um, composition, all kinds of good stuff and performance. And, um, so I dabbled a little bit in everything and I fell into a lot of film scoring classes and was able to <clears throat> compose some pieces and have those play for me in the studio and engineer those. Um, I had a lot of friends that were either we had, we, we actually had a little studio set up in our basement apartment on uh, park drive there right by Fenway um, multiple, multiple friends would swing by and we'd jam some nights. It would be just drums, bass and guitar. Some nights there's three piece, one section, maybe two alto saxes at the same time. Who knows? Hosted a bunch of poker games too. I mean, it was, uh, it was a really good time, but it was, uh, all hands on. Um, one, I mean, one of the, one of the requirements when I got into the school was that you had to buy, this is in 2003, you had to buy a Macintosh laptop and, an interface and software to run. So I was running, you know, pro tools and digital performer, um, in 2003, maybe pro tools in 2004, but definitely digital performer, which you can, you know, if you drag your videos in for film scoring class, they would give you, um, you know, a task like here's a Simpsons episode with no music and you take home, home the scene and you have to compose something for that scene. And, I mean, that's extremely hard to do and put in perspective because you're, if you grow up with the Simpsons, like my generation has 100%, it's hard not to hear what those guys are already writing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, right. that's a and, hard one. Um, I mean, years later, if you look past, past the years at Berkeley, I mean, after Berkeley College of Music is kind of, um, a transitional period. Uh, most of everybody I knew had moved away, um, Mostly, everybody moved to Los Angeles. Um, that was either in production, engineering, composing, film scoring, all that good stuff. And um, it, I eventually found my way out there in 2008. And um, you know, I had some side jobs until I fell into what I really noticed. And 
it really came up in 2012, 2011, when I was starting to work for some production companies and being on set for the first time. And I've always had a really big passion for movies. I, I owned probably 600 DVDs at one point when they started coming out. I just bought every movie ever. Um, Back when DVDs used to be hot. Right, right. <laughs> Right, but I mean, I, I think DVDs, you know, kind of took over my world probably in junior high school, and I mean, I was I was hooked on every movie. You know, I I, I had good taste in film and didn't know it until I um, started getting to that world years later. Yeah, uh, but I, I eventually, you know, you 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 get on set enough, and you notice the the microphones and the the mixing consoles and everything else that I'm familiar with, and you start asking questions, and it. You know, as time grow, goes by, all of a sudden I found myself owning a bunch of this equipment and in this world of capturing what's in front of the lens um, as an audio person, which I didn't learn in college. Yeah, it's, it was, it's so relative, but it's a completely different world, but there's that same medium. Yeah, there is. And I wish I would have, you know, that's one thing I've, uh, even in my charitable donation, when, when Berkeley College of Music will call to, to basically money grab your ass, you know, for like we didn't pay enough to go to school there, but they want you to donate back to the school. Um, they've always they always they always end up asking me what it's funny they could they could do differently. And I and I talked about the, you know the the film scoring program, which is fantastic. But along with the film scoring and composition side of things, they should teach the technical side of film um, and in the field mixing part of that because they really dropped the ball and a lot of that equipment um, is not talked about or taught or seen at Berkeley College of Music. And I know it's a music college, um, but this equipment that we're using has got great capabilities and uh, people need to know that it's portable um, and that it has multiple functions, you know. Mm -hmm. And then also learn what, uh, you know, I know I know film composing is a completely separate, th separate thing from editing um, but Berkeley also teaches music editing and along with film scoring and handing you documents that require you to drag film clips into software and write music for it. They could do more in that, in that film pro program, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. I mean, it makes, you know, as far, as, far as, as, yeah, film mixing and then editing music to sound or, or audio to sound, not just music, not just composing melody for scene work but actually dealing with the audio that you're going to receive to put into the scene work you know, and that's not taught that's something you learn you know out of film school these days like full sale yeah yeah definitely uh so going back to la why did you move to la and, and what was the main reason uh i mean the main reason i if I got to be honest, is is my parents ended up getting a divorce um, in 2007, I believe, right when I got home from school. And my my little sister had graduated college. I, I was home, I would say, about six seven months helping things get smoothed over. You know, my dad moved, um, you know, and 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 for myself, trying to figure out what the hell I wanted to do. And uh, my sister graduated from a fashion college. And was going to head out to Los Angeles. And I said, well, hell, I'll just pack up my stuff and go out there. I've already got my college roommate who I lived with for four and a half years is out there. Um, the guy who lived above us was out there. The guy who lived with him lived in San Diego. It just kind of, you know, made, made sense as a destination. And my sister was going out there as well. So I was, you know, gave it a good shot. Hmm. Okay. And what would you say... Uh Obviously, yeah, you got to start paying the bills now. You're out there, and I know you had a job that was technically involving music for a, just kind of an income job at Guitar Center. But um, would you say people, it's better to work like even in Guitar Center because it's relative to your school major, or do you think people should just go straight to their passion on the side and just get any any job that's actually out of their field? What do you think's better? Oh, I think it's better to go for your passion and go do what you could do. It's it's a matter of, I mean, I'm, I guess it's a matter of self-confidence, not to belittle myself in any kind of way. But for me, 
Um, at that point in time, when I started working at Guitar Center, I had worked for a small record label out in Santa Monica that was like, here's an unpaid internship out of Berklee College of Music, and then after a few months, we're going to pay you. Well, you know, two and a half months in, I'm starting to ask for money, and they offer me $20,000. But I'm working 40 hours a week at this little record label, and there's no way that that was substantial. And um, through that process, I met somebody who actually... I don't remember if we were at a recording session for one of the artists at the label or what we were doing, but um, I met the general manager of the West Los Angeles Guitar Center, and um, they were going to pay me, you know, based on commission and whatnot, and sales wasn't irrelative to me, so I just jumped in, you know. I thought, hell, maybe buy myself a, you know, a nice Martin D28 or something really nice for myself if I can stash some cash away. Um, and, and this, you know, this all kind of coincided with, you know, a lot of a lot of the troubles that I ran into in Los Angeles and a lot of the disappointment disappointment started early. I mean, it's just when you're 25 years old and you've got a record label that hires you and you do two and a half months worth of work as far as building um, artist profiles, doing online, you know, this was in the Facebook. Um, gosh, I can't even think right now. I mean, this was in, in a time where you were just bumping stuff all over the place and in. in and sending out uh, packets to, to bigger labels and um, booking gig, gigs and tours around the country for multiple artists. And, you know, and, and then they refuse to pay you money. And it's, it's not, I'm not the only person that's had that experience out in Los Angeles where you work for free for a couple of months and then end up getting offering what you're not, not even close to what you're worth. And I, you know, I have an opinion of my self worth and that was, you know, 20% of what I thought I could be making. But um, that led, that led me to the guitar, to the guitar center thing, but the guitar center thing was a launching pad into something else. And I got tired of that in about a year and a half. But within, within that time period, I went from just a, an average, uh, Joe working there to the sales manager, uh, of the Northridge location and, you know, was making a decent amount of money, at least to survive and stay open eyed in Los Angeles. Yeah. Which I needed. It's either that or go back to Arkansas where I'd already been in multiple bands and nobody wants to leave town, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, it's a tougher, I, I just think when you dream differently than everybody else and realize that you've got to go search it out a little bit and that's what really took me out that way and what I've been doing this whole time and where I'm not even finished doing what I intend to do, you know? But I've ended up at this place. Yeah. And how did you do the transition into the film industry? The transition to the film industry came with, um, actually through your sister, you know, just through dating her and meeting all of her friends. I, I met a bunch of pr production managers and people that worked in commercials and low budget, um, like advertisement shoots. And I came on board as like an office PA, um, uh, because I was nifty with the computer and, you know, I could three hole punch papers all nice and straight. Uh, <laughs> that's, could, that's exactly. I, could, I was going to say, what does an office PA do? And you just named it. <laughs> just uh, pretty much. I could put no, labels on things that were straight. Um, <laughs> I could, you know, I could plug in multiple hard drives and move documents around. And the funny thing uh, is, it's so important to have that done. So it just has to be done somehow by someone. And, and at the right, and at this point, I'm I, I was an overachiever and really like was like cool. I like film. I like like you know. I started to realize. I mean, the office is the office, and you, you have to show up and sit at your desk and deal with different directors, different producers, different vibes, different energy. I'm not – it's a little stuffy for me, even in Los Angeles. It's just not my thing. Um, but it gave me an eagle-eye view on what, what went down, what the producer did. The producer of all these television commercials were sitting in the same bay as me, along with their production manager, along with the coordinator who's calling you know, every – company around town, Panavision, et cetera, booking and locking down gear, hiring PAs, getting trucks located. Um, you know, and then I'm listening to the production manager and the producers talk to talk money on the phone to the grips to what they're going to pay their guys to the, you know, it, it just went on and on. And I realized really quickly into that office world that, uh, I was kind of looking at the books, numbers, budget, seeing what the coordinator does, I, I, I kind of got the game. You know, there's different groups. You, you can see it on the call sheet. There was different groups and classifications of people. They would all call into the office, and, and I found out what their rates were based on commercials, movies, and all that stuff's accessible online. And, and at the same time, 
I was trying to get on set more. So, you know, on, on these commercial days, I would come into the office and do a nice week worth of prep meetings, all that good stuff, and then go be on set for three days of shooting and then back to the office for rap, which was great because it was giving me, you know, a number of days a month of work um, and keeping me afloat. But it was uh, those three days on set were invaluable because I was spending most of that time picking the sound mixers brains when I wasn't um, being asked to do much. And as an office PA on set, you know, they're normally sitting in a nicely air conditioned RV and just printing tomorrow's call sheet and trying to get a call sheet to an 80 before the day wraps and, and handle that stuff. So an office PA really doesn't have a whole ton to do on shoot days. Most of the workload was on the before and after of shoots. Um, so for me, it was, it was literally like having an eagle eye view of it from, from the, from the inside the office and the makings of it to going on set. And I was kind of wandering around sets um, and I was like, Oh, I want to be an AD. And I'd go watch an AD for that shoot. And then I'd be like, Oh, go talk to sound. And, and the more you got into it, I just, you know, the sound thing was just such a natural fit for me and, um, cardioid patterns of microphones, all that kind of stuff. I'd been into in high school, you know, I, I'd been interested in the why people were using these things and always, always kind of been a geek taking apart, you know, wireless phones in the house when I was a kid and putting them back together, and Nintendo controllers, Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, it, it was just a kind natural of all, fit. Yeah. It was a really good fit for me. Cool. And once I realized it, um, I spent my first $10,000 that I could and, um, bought a very small kit and started doing that and boom operating as much as possible. Hmm. That's cool. And so you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned overachieving and I want to talk to you about that. It's, it's funny you mentioned it. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> you definitely, you helped me out get some PA jobs uh, early on, and I worked with you a lot of times, And but then a lot of times I didn't, but you kept working, and I was, I don't know why, I just felt like, how the hell, like, damn, I mean, I know you have a great personality and you're easy to work with, but it was so, it was hard for me to keep them consistent without, like, you getting me on sometimes in the commercial world, and I wanted to ask you... <laughs> If you remember what you do, there was a time that uh, this producer and owner of a, co- a production company that uh, I won't name Precision, uh, they, but they actually made you, <laughs> you, you, you hired me and I was actually so thankful. It was a fun week and a half or two weeks and then they made you fire me. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Can you tell me the, the anecdote? Oh, well... The antidote I got was that we had to fire Tony and that I had to do it because I brought him on because he emailed, um, I won't say his name, but you emailed the owner of the company. No, uh, the director. It was the director that they hired, right. the owner hired on. That's who Oh, I that's mean. right. That's right. That, that is correct. It was an outside director and you had emailed him just letting him know like you were experienced in camera work and interested in doing camera stuff and all that, which – Personally, Tony, I never found offensive in any kind of way, but I did show up to work having to fire you for sending the director a direct email. But and, you know, which which is all great, but in 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 politics, which is half of what the shit is, you know, it was the order of the day. It was so stupid. It was, and it was very, such a, it's, 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 it's such a small company that only shoots for one company. Yeah, uh, I won't name that com- company either. HP, but that's it. You know, <laughs> but the funny. Funny part was, I mean, I, I my my intentions was just uh, this. I I was hired with from you as a PA, and it was like my first office PA job. But since I can do cameras, since I can edit, by the end of the week they were actually paying me the same, but having me film the the auditions and then having me edit the selections that the director made. And the way I approached it was, I was with the director for the one full casting day from nine a.m. till five p.m. And we became, we really became like, had like really good rapport. We went outside for his smoke break and I, I chatted with him. He was opening up and how he became a director because that's, that was my path that I was looking to do. And he would, when like a, a, a guy auditioned, once they left, he'd be, he'd look at me and be like, what'd you think? And we would actually talk back and forth. So the whole day we, I had this good rapport. So I'm like, oh, he even, I think he even gave me his card or something. So I'm like, oh, let me, we're going to do the shoot. And I'm going to be on set. Let me. First of all, like thank him for a good day, and then just let him know that what I'm interested in, and and it's funny, like I had no thought of oh, 
I'm I'm going against the politics. I shouldn't email someone. You know? Well, yeah, and, and the way that the producer who was hired on pretty much full time saw that was, um, you know, you're impeding on the how can I say this? The in-house functionings of that because they have a very cheap way of doing what they were doing. They don't want anybody else getting hired and paid money to come in and, and help shoot or operate. Or they're going to have the same guys that are in the edit bay or working in the office all day long. Yeah, do all the shooting for them. <laughs> uh, I mean, hell, they they hired me as a coordinator. That was also my first coordinating oh. uh, job at the same time. Um, working for that company, you know, they were paying me a solid four hundred dollars a day uh, and running me ragged because they're so low budget and so and so cheap. You know, mm-hmm. getting locations and and. and Getting locations alone for me was a nightmare. Um, and actually, it's interesting that you brought that up because that place um, was so small and they owned in-house audio equipment. That was my first chance to literally get my hands on all uh, fi- uh, sound mixing uh, sound devices, 552. They had a 416 Sennheiser, a 50. They had um, some 411 receivers that had just come out, and then they had some um, some old UM400A transmitters, and it was the first time I could see and touch and kind of like be around it without somebody keeping their eye on me, which was great. Not that I misused it or anything, yeah. but um, mm. it was in the closet, and it got used by, um, by the crew all the time, and um, eventually I started getting – I did a non-paid uh, – what are those uh, – the Doritos, they do that commercial contest everywhere where one commercial wins a Super Bowl ad. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we, we did, I did one of those for free and they let me take that, that equipment out. Um, so I actually used that equipment and rented that equipment from them three or four times on out of pocket on jobs just to get into the sound world. That was right before. Um, and, and on the same point with that, that company doing the coordinating job also made me want to hang myself figuratively and i realized i wanted to do sound so it, it was literally like a perfect merger of time even though you your story is hilarious about getting <laughs> fired on the thing for me it was like oh i'm coordinating i gotta bust my ass oh i hate this shit yeah it was oh, actually a cool blessing stuff. that i got fired because i fucking hated that the the, the owner slash director oh, yeah. like he was a i dick. couldn't i Dude, and that's how all of the uh, I, just all those small little production companies. I'm so, no offense to all you folks out there who might hire me in the future, but you're all you got to you got to brighten the tone up a little bit. <laughs> I know it's like we're we're trying to have do professional work, but it's like yeah. a, it's playtime. You know, come on. You know, you know, you can't order a seared tuna sandwich um, to wherever you are for lunch and then complain about it being too raw or cooked too through or too cold uh, because it's it's a fucking seared tuna sandwich. You know. <laughs> to you, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So no, but th- that was literally a jumping point. It was like I don't want to coordinate or do any of this riffraff, um, and I want to do sound. And and then all of a sudden, I was I told some people that I wanted to do sound. Like, well, do you want to come shoot this with me? Sure. And then I was renting the gear from them to go shoot that. Um, and that was kind of my Los Angeles turning point. And then um, that was probably end of the year of 2010 or 2012. In in January 2013, I bought um, my first rig, and that was and that's when I said no more PA for good and no more coordinating or being in the office anymore, and just went for it. Uh, now I kind of have two questions that might be able to combine into one. Um, how can people in similar situations, let's say my position at that time, but also your position, how can they avoid um, something like that happening and still grow? Because first of all, I I felt really bad about it because it could damage your, you know, position with the company. But you managed to be still be able to rent out equipment from them for free and blah blah blah. So, what's your thoughts on that? Hmm. I, I think we grow no matter what happens. I like to think unless you're just suffering from some kind of mental hardship or, or just not able to, uh, you know download enough data so to speak like you know we all grow from every experience we have you know not every experience i have with my children is a blessing from jesus you know i mean there's poop smeared on the wall and 
two in the morning things that happen that are just like, why would this happen to me right now? But you know, it, it, it's all for the betterment going down the line. And I, I think just doing whatever you can, the way you think you should is in part trying to get to your dream. You know, I mean, it, it, don't be a coward and don't reach, you know, stand back and not reach for what you're actually trying to do. This is, I'm, I'm somebody who really, you know, made dreams as they came. Honestly, I didn't want to be a musician as a six year old. I wanted to do that as an 18 year old, went to Berkeley college of music. And then, you know, I fell into this and wanted to be a, a sound mixer. So I became a sound mixer. Um, it's not like I had some inevitable dream where I'm going to be the best dancer in the world. It's just when I, get inspired and get in contact with something that I've loved. Uh, I'm going to do it all the way and, and, and do it the best I can. And I mean, even when I got involved in sound mixing, there's different realms of that. You have to make decisions on like reality TV versus uh, scripted television versus, um, you know, carrying a bag around your shoulders and your waist all the time to doing cart work, but you have to own the amount of equipment to, to, to have a cart. And it's, um, you have to be seen on set using a cart to get calls to use your cart. It's a whole, political scam you know the scheme and sometimes it doesn't go your way i mean sometimes i have people cancel 30 hours before shooting and and uh, as long as they do it with, within 24 hours they don't owe me any money and your schedule can get hectic and things get weird but it doesn't stop the dream and tomorrow's going to come um <laughs> i mean really it, it, it's going it, to some the phone's going to ring at some point and you just got to keep putting your best self out there and and, and hopefully it connects you to what you're really wanting to be doing i mean i had i had no idea that i wanted to do sound for film and it's a very technical job and i consider myself more of a creative type person uh, but there's a lot of creativity within the technical aspect of it and um you can kind of you're not going to ever reinvent the wheel but you can definitely have your own touch and your own way of doing things on every aspect of doing sound for film yeah yeah and i think the being the creative part is besides some of the technical stuff or it's like technical meets being able to think quick from other past situations, but mold them to this situation. And that's creativity for sure in itself. I mean, yeah. What are you going to do when somebody shows up wearing a, a chain link armored shirt, you know, that weighs 30 pounds that, um, you know, a sword can't penetrate, you know, you know, you have to really, you have to kind of get creative on a wireless microphone. It's a big wide set. Uh, and your boom operator's got lights everywhere and shadows everywhere. What do you do? You know, do you plant a microphone? Is it, uh, do you tape down using two sided tape? Some of the, the jingly janglies around the microphone area to minimize. I mean, where are you going to go? Um, is it a gentleman? Is, does he have a hairy chest? Can you go underneath that? I mean, it's all to me, it sounds technical to everybody. It's creativity yeah. in the moment of trying to be technical. So it's kind of a merger of both worlds and I really enjoy it. Sounds like that. Yeah. Can you walk us through what was? Do you remember like what was your first audio gig on set like? How did that go? Was it crazy? How was it? No, it was very good actually. I already had a lead in because I'd been on several sets, but I, I will tell you, I was nervous. I um, was boom operating for. I'm going to throw out a couple names here because it was actually quite. Um, I'll talk about the week because it was a week long shoot. I forget the name of the project now. Um, it'll have to come to me. It was brilliantly funny and awesome dialogue as about these park rangers that were up in the hills in California and they were like so stupid. They got lost and imagine, you know, got so dehydrated. They started hallucinating and seeing imaginary characters and, um, I have to look it up, but the, the, the field mixers for this were, uh, Nico Staub, who's out in LA, my homeboy bass, tremendous, tremendous musician too. And bass player for King Llama. I'm going to throw it out to him in case anybody's listening. Go check out, go check out King Llama. If you're around and you like wicked progressive music, they're, they're, uh, they'll melt your face a little bit. But he's uh, from Argentina and one hell of a human being. And he's got this big afro full of hair and always got like a boombox uh, playing his music, Latin music and drinking his matcha hot tea. Um, and I showed up to my first day with, with Nico and it was my first day boom operating for anybody. So it was my first day at a sound cart doing somebody else's like thing. I thought I knew what I was getting into. I wasn't too terribly nervous. I've been more nervous for some mixing gigs than I was for my first initial boom operating gig. But I think a lot of that had to do with who I was working with. Um, 
but it was a really great experience. It was scripted. It was um, very funny. Um, we had four wires and a boom, and there was a lot that I learned on that set. I, I remember just Nico having fun with it, but being very suave with how he approached talent and got them mic'd. Um, we talked a lot about which microphones to use um, and placement and, and hiding techniques. And then um, he's a big fan of a Neumann, uh, what is it, a KI-81 or KL-81 um, microphone. What they use for overhead for drum cymbals a lot is what he uses for his boom mic, very versatile mic. And um, just... I had an amazing experience. We were all over Griffith Park and out in uh, Sierra Madre and the zoo. Um, and what I really remember is on day two or three of this that um, they had wrapped us for the day. And I was packing up some stuff in Nico's uh, vehicle. And they called for some wild sounds of um, you know footprints in the dirt. In the, in the sandy hills up there. And Nico just grabbed his bag on his harness and said, I'll go get it. And I'm like, are you sure, dude? I'll run out there and be glad to boom it for you while you sit tight. And he ran out there with his bag. And he, the ADs didn't tell him uh, that they were going to be detonating some unused dynamite that we had from the day before. And, yeah, and they didn't announce it. And while so Nico's out there with his gain turned pretty high trying to get people just kicking around dirt and rocks with their feet, um, they set off this this dynamite um, explosive device, whatever it was. And it, I, I just remember seeing him, his boom pole smashed to the ground and his headphones went flying and uh, his boom pole was smashed in half. Uh, but I mean, literally it hurt his ears so bad that uh, he thought he was going to have some hearing problems. And um, he ended up leaving set after that and, and not coming back for the rest of the project. Um, which was a was a which was a crazy experience because I learned that was the first time I'd ever seen somebody tell you to go fuck yourself on a set, um, and it was damn well appropriate because nobody called that out with a megaphone, nobody announced they were going to be doing this. They had wrapped us and called them back out there, just um, safety protocol type stuff, and really could have hurt, hurt him bad. Um, thankfully he's he's one hundred percent fine and traveling around the world doing music and sound and kicking ass in life. Um, if you ever get a chance to contact him or look him up, man, he should, he's right there on, uh, he's right there in Hollywood, dude. He's, he's a badass. Um, and then he was, uh, filled in, um, one of the production manager that I'd worked for as a PA for years, ended up hiring a guy from Minnesota that had just moved out named Tom Colvin, who I believe is still out there rocking and rolling. Um, and he is probably the most pragmatic and, um, smartest mixer still that I've worked under um, just incredibly gifted and driven um, and his demeanor is very professional. He probably comes off as he's 10 years older than he is. And he really just um, has an amazing array of equipment. And uh, he showed up to take Nico's place. And I just, that led from ending that shoot into several more jobs. I remember one job in particular was a 10 night shoot for a movie. Um, kind of a kidnapping horror film all shot at night, really long nights. We're talking like 6 PM till 7 AM eating subway sandwiches at midnight. Uh, and, but, uh, being his boom operator and he was really demanding of me. He was, um, everything had to be talking about steady cam shots, backing up through hallways and doing, um, rolling dolly shots. Everything had to be hard lined with him. Um, no wireless boom. I mean, you're talking about 70 feet of 50 to 70 feet of cable, um, running that, wrapping that and trying to not run when somebody's running and shaking the boom pole and, um, really rode me hard and, and helped me get a really keen eye and ear to what, what professionalism is and, and, and how to go about, um, doing sound like all there is to it. Um, so that's, that was my first week of work and it led me down a rabbit hole and I, I ended up renting gear from Tom for a while, renting gear from Nico for some student projects over at Santa Monica city college that I got involved with. Uh, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I mixed a movie, um, for Santa Monica city college. And I'm trying to remember the director's name was Kevin and this beautiful film called Cora. 
C O R A Cora. And uh, we were shooting down in um, like south of Redondo Beach area. Um, and it was my first mixing gig. And Nico had let me borrow his um, equipment, his 442 and a 702 to go out there and, and, and do this little bitty movie for Santa Monica City College. And it was a brilliant thing. I worked with this DP, Vishal Solanke, who is still out there, and um, an amazingly talented cat, um, who also was the DP on the movie we were doing as well at the time. But I did this short film, um, and uh, <laughs> I ended up getting about a mile from set and had to pull over and, and throw up out of my car door because I was – literally so nervous that I was going to be mixing a movie with four people on camera at once. Really? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was 30 year old, 29 year old man, 28 year old man throwing up at the side of his car. Yeah. Uh, before I got there, you know, and then of course I get there and get my little, uh, roller cart and my gear set up and everything went off without a hitch. And I had like, um, uh, a student that was designated as my boom operator that was interested in doing sound um, so it was more like I was like the audio coach, um, and they did the project as a student film, but the film turned out to be absolutely stunningly gorgeous and, um, really cool. But yeah, I, I, uh, I rented some gear and, and made a drive about 45 minutes south of LA and pulled over my car and threw up everything I had for breakfast and sweated through my shirt, turned on the AC and, um, showed up and did my job, you know, and that was my first day of mixing. I'm the department lead on something I probably... I'm unqualified for, but because they're only paying, you know, what, one hundred and fifty dollars for the day, they're going to get an un- they're going to get an unqualified person. Thankfully, they sent me. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and uh, actually, I really um, I took a lot away from that project as well. Um, and that's honestly when I decided that I wanted to try my hand at mixing full time uh, was when I was doing the Cora and. Um, you know, and it got tough to make that transition in based on the context that I had in Los Angeles, just because the, the commercial world was all union, all two brothers that have two sons that all have uncles and cousins that all have been in the industry for 40 years. You know, it's everybody's kind of got their spot and it, it was a little difficult and, um, but I had a good run of it for my first year doing smaller projects, but not getting very much money for mixing. And then, um, in 20, 2014, your sister, my wife and I, we moved out to new Orleans, like two crazy banshees and, and thought we could make something happen. And, and sure enough, it's been, um, the busiest and craziest, um, section of my life by far and away. Yeah, that's that's amazing to move from L.A., which everyone thinks is always, oh, that's the place to be. If you want to make a living in the film industry, got to be in L.A. Like Even New York is not, not that uh, prominent for, for that type. But uh, New Orleans, you figured it out and realized it was a good move. And now you're doing top shit. So. Yeah, well, and it, you know, it comes down to a lot of luck. And like we were talking about earlier about what do you say to people in pursuing their dreams and where to sidestep and do all this. I. I had no idea any of this stuff was kind of coming at me, but it's just, you know, you move down to New Orleans and things like this happen where you meet somebody. Um, and I met my buddy, Justin Ditch, who was, you know, just like an assistant manager of the, the only sound shop that happened to be in town. And within, you know, and I was getting hooked up. I'm not going to say, you know, totally hooked up, but they do, they do really, really good pricing on the rentals for small stuff. And, um, considering I had the main package together, they helped me out quite a bit. And, um, the real hookup with, with that, with them came, uh, with promoting my name out to people that would call into the shop locally here, which I didn't know they were going to be doing, but I brought, you know, if I, I went in and introduced myself a few times, third or fourth time I had some business cards printed up with my new new Orleans address and all that. And, uh, you know, they took them and put them on the wall on their desk and on the wall. And, uh, sure enough, started getting busy with some stuff and then I had to keep on um, spending money to build out bigger rigs. Um, and uh, my buddy Justin ends up becoming not only the general manager of the store within a short period of time, but buying out the owner and, and now is the full owner of the only uh, sound shop in, in the greater New Orleans area. And it just so happens to be a guy that I met 
and we became really quick friends here. And, and now he's kind of not only he's, he helped promote me when I got here and he's still promoting me today. And, um, you know, for, I, I, I didn't see that coming in any kind of way, shape or form. It was just me shaking somebody's hand that was young and wearing a sweet t-shirt, you know, and helped me out and was, was smart. But it, when it came to a lot of like repairing cables on the fly and getting some things done that I didn't have time to do between jobs, man, these guys were saving my butt and, um, they still come through today. And, um, you know, I couldn't have predicted that moving to New Orleans was going to be more opportunity than Los Angeles. And I can't say that it actually has been more opportunity, but I can say that I've enjoyed what I've been doing and the ride's been good and the experiences have been a blessing and they're leading me to where I want to go. How do you, how do you make personally, how do you make strong relationships and keep them? It sounds like you're good at that. Like what, I mean, I know you've probably never broken it down. You just naturally have it, I'm sure. But can you break it down a little? Boy, that's hard to ask. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> especially these days. Cause it, it doesn't seem like I, it's not like I go out to the rap parties and, um, have four beers with them and do karaoke and, um, uh, or go out on the last day shoot day of, you know, a three day week, um, uh, with a two year old and a one year old. I'm, I'm trying to get home as fast as possible. So I spend very little time socializing outside of the work realm. And when they push you, you know, 12, 13 hours, it's, it's hard. And, you know, the family's demanding on you, especially when the children are this young. So, um, I really don't know what I do besides I do good work. I communicate well. Um, you know, I, I don't undercut anybody. I actually offer the same kind of three day rentals for, for the week that our local sound shop does. I, I keep the prices where they should be. I keep my day rate where they should be. And I, I r- rarely have any problems. I mean, there's always negotiation when it comes down to funds that take place. But for some reason um, I, I get my fair share of good luck, you know, and I've been, Plus, that could all change tomorrow. I don't know. I could inherit a lisp, and people don't like talking to me on the phone, and I'll never <laughs> get another call. So, <laughs> it's funny. Oh man, yeah. Hmm. Um, when you int- introduce yourself to new people and new mixers to to learn from them and and try to be like, hey, I'm available. I would love to work with you. What was it working for free with them that you think really made them? trust you or just showing them that you really are interested or questions or, or what? Oh no, I was, I was, I was interested in, um, speaking of sound, I've got a plane going overhead now, so we're going to have that, uh, yeah, hold for plane. Uh, no, honestly, man, I, I met some sound guys when I met Nico. Uh, I mean, the dude has just got like 13, 14 different types of instruments sitting in his apartment, you know? And it's like, it was beyond, it, it was just beyond anything like simple and straightforward. And that's not what I do is as, as, as often I come off the people I think is simple and straightforward. Cause I'm kind of this, you know, Northern Arkansas white boy who's, who's polite and who grew up being kind of a yes man. But I, but honestly I have a strong opinion about just about everything that I get involved with. And I'm pretty um, set on following my gut and if something typically if something tells me, it doesn't make sense or something's not working. I'm going to, I'm going to be all over that. Like yesterday. Um, but as far as communicating with people and, and, and doing the right thing, I think it's just, I don't know. Maybe it's in my blood. I mean, my dad is, has, has been that way too. I would say my dad's uh, a little bit more rigid than I am. Um, and there's some things that, you know, some qualities, I guess everybody deals with that they inherit that are, that are tough to get around. My dad is damn well, a a people person and can talk in front of a crowd and walk into a room and say hi to everybody. And I think being around that and him toting me around with him everywhere on business trips when I was young, you know, I mean, he was taking me on really fancy business trips that my mom didn't want to go on or couldn't make, um, in my early teenage years, you know, 13 to 17 years old. And we were, you know, I'm sitting at a dinner table with 40 executives, from around the globe doing something. I'm a little kid in a suit eating a, you know, <laughs> rare steak, you know, yeah. but you learn, you learn how to talk and people ask me adult questions when I was a kid. And, mm. um, I think there's just a natural flow to that. And what I really like about being on set is it also has this flow to it, like a band or not, not like a four piece rock band, but more like a, like a choir or 
like a big jazz band. It's it's really got all these moving parts, and the sound guy is kind of like the bass player. We're kind of extremely necessary. We've always got to be there, and if we're not, we're effed. But you're not yeah. going to pay attention to me. Uh, whereas, like the the assistant directors are the drum. They are definitely beating the clock. They are making things happen at that point, you know. And it's the camera guys are your lead guitar players. Your actors and actresses' talent are your lead singers. So you start you start doing this. For me, just like I still am living my dream of being a rock star. What music was all that stuff that led me there? I'm still playing a part in this group, communicating to make a project that needs to be successful. And that's what gets me off. And like, and, and honestly, that's what I hope to be doing. I just turned 35 years old. I mean, by the time I'm 50, I'm, I'm hoping to be, you know, doing some of these beautiful television shows that are, you know, right now being paid for by Netflix, Hulu, et cetera, the breaking bads with all the, the camera angles that broke all the rules. There's just, I want to do some edgy scripted, beautiful work. And I just want to get that opportunity, you know, to really get into that. And, you know, it's going to happen. Hell yeah. That's where it is. Yeah. That's just where it is. Hmm. Okay, let's talk some gear um, and geek out, if you will. Um, Nerd alert! <laughs> what, what, was, what basic gear package would you suggest for people that are new to audio or you know, girls or guys that want to start out, but obviously they can't break their budget, but where would they go and how, much, how far should they push? Oh, I, I mean, a basic package is going to consist of a mixer slash recorder or a mixer and a recorder combo depending on how old the equipment is and um, two, two wireless microphones. Any uh, brand names with these or like uh, good advice for the beginnings? Oh, for sure. I mean, there's recommended stuff. If you show up with, um, you know, sound devices or Zaxcom recorders, mixers and Zaxcom wireless units, um, you're going to get big smiles. If you show up with electrosonics, um, wireless gear you're definitely going to fit right in like a glove and nobody's going to have any scoffs at what you're doing um however there are some less pricey things the sennheiser g-series stuff is very very good um and i've had a lot of success with them in fact my first package i i bought was uh when i spent my original ten thousand dollars which was the world and then some um asking a huge favor of my dad actually to help me out with part of that loan, um, you know, was the sound devices 633. I wanted the sound devices re- recorder slash mixer because it was, you know, all, all, all in one. You can mix and record to a CF card, an SD card, and, and up to six channels at a time um, with this machine. And I ended up getting the Sennheiser G3 uh, or the G2 units at the time. Um, as my wireless, and I survived some like independent films and some low budget stuff with um, with those with those ME two microphones that come on those Sennheiser units, and like I mean, things that people scoff at and talk shit about. Honestly, um, they're still pro- broadcast quality, and you can still do a project with them. I mean, they still serve a purpose. I still carry four or five sets of those in my bag. I use them for all kinds of different things, you know. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, I, I think I have one ME two mic. But I don't have the wireless anymore. I just I actually just use it with my Zoom uh, H6 if I need it just for like a quick something, you know. Yeah. But yeah, they're they're good. Okay, great. Yeah, that that and a boom microphone. I mean, you need your two wires, a recorder slash or a mixer, and a mixer and 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 a boom microphone. Would you say the 415 uh, was good or 416 microphone to start with for the boom mic? That's a great microphone. And the reason it's so great, that and the Sankin CS3E are um, both very, very good, actually. They're um, about the same comparable in price between, I, I'd say about $900 to $1,100. And, and they pair kind of with everything that's out there. I mean, the reason I use a lot of the Sennheiser boom stuff, as shotgun mics and, and cardioids and all that down here in, in New Orleans is because of the humidity and it does quite a number on a lot of the Sheps and German engineered stuff and the lighter weight um, products and the things that just have a lot more exposed parts. Cool. What type of person is good fit for the audio world? Oh, 
I don't know if there is a type of person, um, but there's definitely some traits that you might naturally follow. I don't know. I mean, pe people that um, can pay attention to minute detail, um, especially when it comes to anything audible. Um, anybody that's interested in the sounds of a guitar or interested in music or loves listening to the wind blow through the trees, honestly, it's, it's anybody that, that can recall those parts of the brain and like actually uses them on a daily basis um, and thinks about things harmonically. And, um, and if they don't, they can become keen to it as well. Somebody that's open just to opening their ears and listening to what's really going on around us at all times. It's, um, I don't think there's a right type of person for it necessarily. I think it's just a matter of liking you know the the artistic side and the in the the human quality that you have, but also the hours, the inconsistency of the work, the you know everything that else goes into it. Yeah, that's what I was uh, asking more of. Uh, yeah. Like, there definitely has to be a learned patience or an innate patience for sound. I would say, right? Oh yeah, and we're never right, and that's <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it, it it all depends on who you're working with and and whatnot, but it's. Um, you definitely have got to be patient. You've got to be with able to, you know, shoot for a long amount of time and be hot, sweaty, um, making things move a lot, not happening, but you're working a lot for some reason. You've, um, got to be able to deal with a lot of downtime and you got to be ready to be on your a game on the 13th hour, you know, getting the hero shot of the whole damn thing. Cause that's when they'll do it to you. You know, you've got to be able to bring your a game really yeah, yeah. It, and you've got to be able to manage your schedule and it's it's hard i mean the more things you have involved in your life it's it's very hard it's hard with a with a wife and children and, and the whole thing to go okay i'm not working for a whole week but then i have three days here and two days there and then a day off and then three days on and, and you know it gets and then those go away and they're replaced by something else a month from now and it's just yeah it's crazy and it's then crazy at, at, at your level when when you do get a call, let's say you have three or four days off, you do get a call and you were expecting maybe a week and a half off and you kind of, have you noticed you have to just accept the job usually if it's, you know, in your budget range that you, you know, you prefer, you pretty much have to accept it because if you don't, they might not stop, stop calling you. Right. Is that how it might be? Yeah. There's, yeah. There's always that risk. Absolutely. There's, there's always that risk. And that, that was the number one concern I've had for ages. And then it's just, now I've got to ask my wife. So, um, you know, those I, I don't see myself as putting my relationships with people and producers that are calling in peril because of what my family needs. But I definitely have to take that in consideration. And in all honesty, the more open I am about that conversation with uh, with people, the the more respect I get for it because it's just part of it. You know, whereas you know, me four years ago was just say yes to every job that called. Yeah, I think in the beginning, I mean, we have to go through those stages, right? Absolutely. And, but then some people, you can stay in that and then you have no, absolute no life outside of your work life and that's a problem. So, yeah. Hmm. All right. Hey, so, okay. <clears throat> what were your biggest novice mistakes or professional mistakes that you think people should really pay attention to because it's easy even for someone with a lot of experience to make well, I, I would say the biggest thing that I've learned is to not – excuse me. I'm grabbing a beer here out of the fridge. What, what is it, noon? All right, good. Good. Uh, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that I've run into is, A, saving your data, making sure you back up all your data because you never know when somebody's going to call you for something that you need to take a listen to or send over. Just double backing up everything, honestly, just to have because you can't trust – Anyone with the transfer of media, um, because it always ends up coming back on to you somehow, some way. You know, it's always that game of, well, she said, he said, blah blah blah, which puts you in a in a not winning situation. And what you want to do is always put yourself in a winning situation. And the way to do that is to, what what I was going to say was is the pain in the ass part is you know after a thirteen hour day, you drive home, you unload your gear. You're tired, but then you've got to sit down and back up your deck for the day, 
format your cards for tomorrow. You know, you, you've already signed your time card. You've been off work for two hours, and you're just now doing media transfer. Um, would be something that it just takes a little extra gusto to do. And you know, and I've been guilty of not doing that. And I've had that actually bite me in the ass uh, on a particular on, on a pretty big job. And um, but it was one of those things where it's, you know it's raining seven days in a row and freezing cold, and I'm on set where there's one tent and it's me and like four cameras in a tent and I'm underneath a bag underneath the tent cause I'm getting partially rained on. And you know, it's one of those nights you come home and don't feel like pulling everything out of your car and it's raining and I didn't back up the data and just formatted the card and they didn't have it. They didn't have that few files from that day before. And you know, it cost me probably a potential to do that show down the line. Interesting. And is it, uh, is it common? I mean, usually once you when you do wrap, you hand your or as your cards fill up, who who hands the cards to the data manager on set? Are you directly? Do you do that, or you give it to your one? Of your yeah, guys? yeah, yeah. I do that. Yeah. Have you ever? Because <laughs> it's funny. I actually camera guys do this a lot of the times. <laughs> you just find out. Oh shit! I'm not rolling. And uh, what do you do? Oh, you tell the person in charge exactly what just happened. Good. Yeah, you got to. Right? Oh, <laughs> uh, it, it sucks, but you got to be like, I, I, if you wait for another scene, you can't tell anybody now. I mean, what are you going to do now? You know, you got you got to just speak up. Um, and that, unfortunately for me, I, I don't think that's happened to me in any kind of scripted setting. But it, um, and it's happened to me out of a bag. You know, trying to you know manage a couple wires and a boom on a windy day, and you know. You thought you heard somebody say cut and they didn't say and their camera's still rolling. You, I have the boom in the air, think you're still rolling. You look down and you weren't rolling, you know? Um, yeah. It's like have that yeah. format repeat. Even if you've been doing it for years, you have that, re- that some kind of repeat in your head that says, so it's just like me. Okay, when I leave my house, still to this day, I'm, I leave keys places, but I, I try to do the, oh, keys, phone, wallet. Okay, I'm good. It's the same thing on set, right? Yeah, Absolutely. But we still don't record. Sometimes we still leave our keys places. But uh. yeah, you get better as you go, and and hopefully, you know, it's like the longer you live in your house, the more you have things set where they go. You know, and that just helps you along the way. Yeah, routine is, is king in in some aspects of life for sure. Absolutely. Okay, here's a great topic that people maybe some people are aware of, but they don't know how it works, and you definitely do. You worked on the TV show called The Killing Fields, um, and I remember you were telling me that it was such a long drive. It was a, kind of a big deal to continue doing it. But and correct me if I'm wrong, but was that the show that after working for a season, you actually took time off, but let them continue to rent your gear like full time? Uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, I, I shot two complete seasons with them. Um, and then they moved the show to a different location up in Virginia, like outside of Washington, D.C. And they took they did rent my gear for the season, this past season. And how was that just because you were on the shoot? How did you figure that out? Because it was just it was just too far removed for you, like to, to just work or how did they? Oh, yeah. I mean, they asked me to come up there, but we were um, the second baby was due on. Like March, around the March 20th area, she ended up being born on the 22nd, and they started shooting on like the first week of April. And did you so, did you propose it, or did they like? How did that go down? Um, I mean, it was a it was kind of initially in, in the thought. It was they wanted to quote for me for what it would be to rent, but they were also interested in buying their own gear because the, you know financially, if they're going to keep shooting season after season, uh, you don't want to just flush money down the drain. So I took um, some time to get a few quotes together for them. And then I also put quotes together from, the, from um, for sound packages to buy for the company. I mean, they had already treated me to, to two years of compensation. I mean, like you were saying, it was an hour and a half drive each way from my house. Um, I had two babies within the two and a half or the two years that, I mean, I didn't have them, but we had two babies within that two year period of shooting that show. And they allowed me to have some locals come up and fill in when I couldn't do it. Um, 
but like we were saying earlier, I mean, even though it was a grueling drive and, and, it, and it kicked my butt and I couldn't get any rest for that time period, um, which honestly, just breaking this moment for a second, like now I was getting plenty of rest compared to having the kids now. Like I don't get any rest now. I was getting plenty of rest even with the four-hour turnaround, four hours of sleep and one spurt was what I was doing on Killing Fields. But it was grueling, kicked my butt. It was nine microphones at once in a police office, a sheriff station, and it was literally – I mean you really cannot tell officers how to – how to be portrayed or how to go about things because they have a job and a service to provide. And, um, it, it was a very interesting show, but I, I built that relationship with sirens media out of, they were out of New York and they've moved recently moved their headquarters, I believe to Maryland. Um, but just, they're really great people. And, um, when I, when I said I couldn't mix the show, I ended up giving them a full range of what they could rent from me um, and then what, how much it would be to buy everything they would need to do the show the way we've been doing it. And um, actually this will, this will be a shout out to Eric Rice. Who's up in recent new transfer up to New York city from new Orleans um, had helped me out when we had the baby. He had, he had gone up there several times for me to help out um, wanted to go shoot the season. So sirens hired him to fly out to Maryland in Virginia and shoot season three. And, and once Eric agreed to do it and the, all the producers were already familiar with him. Um, and he's a great, great guy. Um, he kind of championed my gear. Honestly, he came at it from both sides. He, he convinced them to look at me a little harder about giving them a better price. Um, and his, that he was more comfortable using the same gear that we had used the past two seasons when he had filled in. And, um, when push came to shove, I, I just, Ended up working out. I mean, it was it was a pretty discounted deal. I'm not, you know, I know there's going to be snobs out there in the sound world that are going to snub their nose at me, but you got to remember they give me two years of income off of two seasons of shows, and then yeah, they're taking yeah. my gear and leaving me with another package to do work with here. Um, you know, we made a 12 week agreement on that, and they ended up shooting like 25 weeks or something. I mean, it went wow. More than double, and, and I, I discounted it, you know, 10% after the 12-week mark, another 10% after the 20th week. Hmm. Just, uh, and Eric kept it in completely great shape, which for all you guys that are in the sound world, like when you're using somebody else's gear, uh, even at the rental, from a rental house and stuff, I know you want to be providing your own gear on these shows and, you know, you're making your hourly rate, but take care of the gear, take care of the whips, take care of all your connectors, label any problems just like keep things clean because it, it just it really does help out in the long term um mm -hmm. yeah. but you know that that was the thing you know and i and i know that sirens media is probably going to go on and shoot another season of that show but they'll probably buy gear at this point you know at this point it's probably in their best interest to spend sixty thousand dollars instead of paying me twenty thousand dollars or twenty five thousand dollars for the year to rent you know six wires in a 664 you know yeah Wow, but that definitely worked out well. I mean, it seems right. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, now when when you when times are financially tough in the film industry and you can't rent your gear out or you can't rent yourself out, and this could be a recent thing or sometime in the past and the beginnings, how do you handle it overall? And, and any methods that you've figured out to get you to the next gig when you're actually maybe worried about getting the next gig. How do you come out of that and get that next gig? Yeah. It's an interesting question. Not, I mean, I reach out to people for sure. Um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with my personality and just how I meet and greet with people. Um, I can, I consider everybody in the sound industry here in new Orleans, my friend. Um, I really have not met a person that I think's not an amazing human being. And I would go, you know, to battle for them as I'd hope they would for me. So, I mean, um, if somebody were to hit me up and say they're, you know, they haven't had work in a few weeks or asked me what I'm working on. And if there's any call I get, I will pass that along to somebody that's called me recently or hit me up or that I know had a show that just ended and they're looking for work or, um, really we're kind of, we've kind of got a tight knit community around here. And I, and through the sound shop, I kind of know where a lot of people are if they're on vacation or, 
uh, it's really interesting because I get producers calling me from New York and LA and I can basically tell them over the phone who's, if I'm not available, I can also tell them the other 10 people that aren't available at the moment. Um, um, and make some referrals that way. And oftentimes giving out good referrals can get you a phone call back for something else too, you know? Oh that, yeah, that's a good one. Definitely. Yeah. Offering value to people. And even if you do refer someone and maybe that person never calls them, it's, it's a good idea to let that person know like, Hey, I referred you just so you know, I'm not sure if they're going to call you. Cause that's, that's definitely back and forth of giving. When you do reach out, Blake, uh, let's say to follow up or or to just say, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while. I just want to say hi. Do you? How do you approach that? Do you actually say, just want like something like that? Like, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while. I hope you're doing great. Just want to let you know I'm available for sound this next two weeks. Like I just finished a gig. Do you, uh, is there a method for that? No, and the, the method for that is over time is just communicating with those people within your network often enough to where it doesn't seem odd. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's local sound mixers that are working on TV programs here that I know and we don't see each other for a long period of time, but there's, there's no shame in like if somebody rent, you know, it, it's just, I've got a friend that rented a wire, they needed an extra wire and I ran it over to them. The shop was out. So I ran them some stuff, you know, and it's just that leads way to be like, Hey, how's the show going? And then a week later, it's like, I don't have any work. It's like, Hey, if you guys ever need any um, second unit or playback stuff, you know, keep me in mind. It's it's never like anything dire or like please help me out. It's it's literally like just keep me in mind if uh, yeah, like you're interested. things come up. I'm definitely interested. And, you know, mm. and a lot of people had a had a perception of me for a long time as they still do as a reality TV kind of carrying a bag type mixer. And I'm I'm trying to shift that paradigm over to you know sitting down and doing this for a long long time type thing. And that's what I want to be doing is something scripted, honestly, and something that. I, I want image is my thing. It's like I've got video monitors on my car and I want to see what I'm listening to um, at all times. And I want to be part of that process and intertwined. Yeah, so. yeah. That, sound, that's, that sounds where it's at. Okay, think about this. In one word or aspect, what are you constantly working on or improving that you're finding to be the most beneficial to you for that goal? Hmm. Definitely not my bank account at this point. I'm trying to think what would be – I mean I guess, I guess it's just managing managing my department and, and being able to be a stern voice and be uh, unable to be shook or pushed around in any kind of way. Um, you know, you if things are wanting to be terminated or things are wanting are giving you problems, you have to go up directly to the source. And if you get voted down by the director, the creator of the show, and the actors, then you have gone up every ladder possible, and you've got to you know just take your take your spanking basically and move on. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> take your spanking. Pretty much, you know, and I had to do that recently on a pretty high budget shoot and they knew that it was going to bring them into a day of ADR work. Um, but they willingly had to admit that to me before I would not, before I would stop complaining about the noise issue. So, mm. so what, what do you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Just what were you complaining about and, and what were you asking? I, uh, more asking than complaining, but it was definitely like a rotating mechanism so it was kind of a, a shot on a jib in a spinning bathtub scene and the me mechanism they had this bathtub rotating with was just like grinding its gears and just droning something awful and there was no way to do a hair microphone um the boom microphone was picking up just straight up droning um it was just this crazy crazy sound and, and in all honesty if you're standing 10 feet from it you're like oh the sound's not that bad but it's like this it's like this droning of a mic that's coming from the floor below the bathtub that is just eating my face so bad you know and it's even at that point uh, it's funny because you go to the assistant director and you're like dude this droning is so bad that i don't think they're going to be able to use it in post it's not you know network quality and it, okay we're going to get it we're going to get it wild lines um and or you know we'll get pickups without the bathtub moving at the end okay well, 
you know, we run through this whole gamut of all these lines that are done in this bathtub, and then four and a half, five hours later, our two actors have been sitting in a hot, basically a hot bubble bath, but a, a hot tub for four or five hours, and are delirious. Uh, and it's approaching lunchtime, and I'm like, all right, we need to get these wild lines. Like all, you know, it's only like six different conversations they're having, right? They're not long. And I, w- I was hoping to get them after each performance while the bathtub was rotating to get that performance without the bathtub pr- rotating. Yeah, and it's still fresh and, on their mind. Uh, and instead, it kept getting deferred to the end. And then when the end came, we were in grace period, 15 minutes over lunch. I got shut down. You know, And this was going to – I went to the director's tent uh, who sit next to script. And I'm like, I have to have this or it's unusable – um, they said they went to the, to the actors, actors were like, we don't care. Like we're getting out of the bathtub. Um, and, and you know, and that's, it is what it is. But you know, the, the funny part is I notated it and put it in the sound report and everything else. I get a call at like 12 midnight, my time, which is way past my bedtime when I'm not working. And, uh, it's the editors out in Los Angeles asking me what's wrong with the scene and why that noise is there. And I'm just like, can you guys read my notes? You know, it's over there on the right-hand column of the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you said that. So that's funny, but yeah, hey, you did your, what you needed to do. You tried to make it better, and then it's it is up to like the yeah the production itself. To- well, and it was interesting too because I I, I got hired by uh, Bruce Latecki, who uh, did um, the last like couple se- three or four seasons of American Horror Story. He's he's done a lot of really, really great stuff. Um, but I was his second unit mixer on that show. So, I mean, I even ran it up up to him. He was on a different set shooting. And I'm like, hey, this is what's going on. My first, This is my first setup on my first day of this job. It's like with a big actor and a big actress. And it was just like, I'm having this issue. It's unusable. And he's, you know, he said the same thing. He ran it up the right chain and there's nothing you could really do about it at this point and i just you know even having somebody who's been around for many many more years than me and that i was able to check in with and you know and, and and at least take a little solace in knowing that hey you know i did all i could yeah that's great i mean you should do everyone should do all they can while they're on set and then once they try and do all they can if they can't uh, go any further then yeah that's, that's all that there is hmm so I have some some last couple last questions and I want to see what comes to mind about okay. really cool things. Uh, what are some great sources or resources for everything sound that people could go to or and, and be, please be specific if any sound goers want to excel in the audio world? Sorry, Tom, I'm going to have to ask that again. I've oh. got a work message here I'm just responding to. Okay. That's another thing. Yeah, that, What's up with text messaging these days? You know, um, I'm no Jerry Seinfeld, but seriously, I get hired on jobs via text message more than I do over the phone. Oh, yeah, I know you, you can't have the tone in the text, and it often gets. Well, it, it, but it's just strange. It's like, hey, are you available to shoot tomorrow? Hey, uh, sure. Who is this? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't have a name <laughs> with the face and the. Uh, yeah, this world with the texting and things, and I don't. I don't I don't know. I try to play by it a little, but I try not to rely on it. And when I, I – now we're going off a tangent, but if I'm selling something online, and I often do as you know, things get old and you want to sell them, I Drugs, literally – the dark, the dark web. The I dark know. web. I <laughs> the write, dark web. I, I write in the top and I say, I will not – or only call. I will not respond to text and, and – I didn't even give my phone number out sometimes. I make them email me because if now it, 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 there's an order. A phone call is serious. An um, email is like, oh, it's kind of serious. And a text, not really. Don't give a shit. And then the app message, that's just like bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But people use it in different ways. It is insane. You know, it's insane. And then you either b- abide by it or like get left behind in a less ridiculous world, but you're left behind. So you got to find that balance. (laughs) Absolutely. Okay. Resources. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about resources and sources for everything sound. And if people are really wanting to excel in audio, what any specific websites or things you might mention? If, if you want great 
and I mean great tutorials over gear and like um, video production on specific sound mixing, uh, field mixing. Um, go to True Audio's website, and that's tr True, like T R E W. And they're out. Glenn True is uh, owner operator. I don't know how old he is nowadays and what he's up to, but he owns that. It's out in L.A. Uh, but they do some really great um, web breakdowns on new products when they come out. So Zach's come will put something out, like the Nomad, and then the Six Series came out from from Sound Devices, and they have all these great videos. And and I mean they go through every input and output and the capabilities of every machine. Um, they also, they obviously, they're a store as well, and they have an online store, and they have really great used gear that comes in. LA's got such a great market for a refurbished and, and gear turnover that you can find some great stuff there. Um, in all honesty, the only reason... We got a car full of clowns pulling up over <laughs> your house? Sorry, yeah, that's... There's a big construction thing across from my office. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I expected like 15 different horn sounds to follow that. I was about yeah. to look out the window and see, yeah, many people get out of a small car. Uh, every day they, uh. they've been having that <laughs> with this construction <laughs> build they have. It's it's monstrous. But, we, we had a guy here in New Orleans that would drive around. He actually just passed away a week ago. That would uh, He had like fresh vegetables and fruit in his, in his truck, and he'd drive around and just go, I got pickles, I got tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I love those guys, man. Yeah. God. He's been doing it for like 45 years of selling fruit and vegetables out of his truck around See, that's, town. that's shameless, beautiful advertising. I, I should literally go out with my camera on the streets and be like, I got cameras. I film make. Because hey, it's hard. You might get offered. Some guys carry around $10,000 that have, you know, that look like they're dressed like bullshit. You know, I, <laughs> you don't know out there in this world. It's weird. Yeah. Um, uh, other resources. I was going to say the only reason I am on Facebook anymore is for um, the freelance sound mixers web page or um, Facebook page, which we uh, a couple of friends of mine and I refer to as a holy grail. Really, uh, dude, it is. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of snarky opinions, and you know, there's some highbrow people that are, you know, that you've always gonna, you're always gonna have your Zaxcom snobs, or people think this product's better, or this technique's better, and all that. I don't, I don't get into all that junk. Every, everything I read, interpret, or whatever is is gaining experience. If you think this miking technique's stupid, well, cool. I might try it next time, you know, to see how stupid it actually is. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't play all that Facebook shit, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't really dig all the comments and stuff, but this. Freelance uh, sound mixers page. You have to be. You have to be approved to be on it. Um, but man, it is full of information. I've I've had things go wrong with my machines. Um, they've also uh, sound devices. And I'm sure Zach's come to too. Has their own Facebook page. I've had um, these are great resources. I've private message sound devices. Um, I've had an issue where. Um, with my mixer where one of the, when I had it deadpan center where, you know, my left side was lower than my right side, even though it was centered up. Um, and I, I literally was on Facebook in Montana at like 6 AM and I'm on Facebook and I asked the question to sound devices website. I literally had a guy get back to me within three minutes to start diagnosing what was going on. And I was able to do a hard reset on the machine uh, and backed up all the data before I did it and get it running by like 625 um, because of Facebook. I, I mean, I've had on the freelance page, if you go in there, some people are going to heckle you. Some people might give you a hard time for not knowing the answer to a question that you're asking, but it's a community. It's, it's useful in that you can ask, say, hey, I'm having this, cl this clicking sound. I'm having an RF issue. I'm having this. And you're going to get comments. In responses to this within seconds of wow. people being like, That's wonderful. oh, have you, have you tried this? You know, it's a new device. Have you tried to do, you can change the voltage reading on this. You could do a hard reset. You could, it, maybe it's the media you're using. Maybe, um, you know, they just came out with a new firmware. It's a firmware hiccup. You've got to download the older style of firmware. It, I mean, it's, I cannot quit Facebook. And I, I literally, I try to have your sister, my wife, Tiana, you know, 
tag me in everything she does that has a photo of me because I I just don't get on there. But yeah. you know, every time every time somebody catches me on if I'm on Facebook, I'm literally only looking at that. Um, and there's also a web page like a where they're selling and trading audio equipment and camera equipment um, as a Facebook page as well. And I'm always just kind of digging through there and looking at what kind of I mean, the freelance sound page is so amazing because somebody's having a problem somewhere and yeah. it's being discussed right there. And it's like, you know, it could be somebody in Amsterdam being like, I'm running a Zoom F8, which is a recorder I barely have any experience with, but they're doing this, that, and the other, and they've got it running to a huge cart rig with multiple cameras, you know, and they're, they take pictures of their carts, what kind of hardware they use to build their cart, what kind of casters they put on the bottom of their, the front portion mm-hmm. of the cart, what they use to weigh down their cart. I mean, I've learned so much. Um, by seeing videos and photos and wa- watching people respond to each other and ask questions on that thing, that it, like it's been unbelievable. That's a good source. Yeah, I I've been told some Facebook groups. Uh, I haven't delved into that too much because I don't know. I need to get going with that because I think that you're you right. you should you should go request uh, the guy Thomas Tomas whatever his name is that runs that group. Just tell him, hey, I'm a I'm a director DP. And I also do my own sound because there's plenty of guys that run their own production companies on there that do sound that – like my buddy George is a, more of a camera guy, but he builds cables out of his garage. He's on there all the time sharing. I mean he'll take pictures of the gauges of the cable, which connector – like he'll do a diagram of a connector with his own little yellow arrows where to like ground things. You know, it's – I mean it. you can really get geeky. You can really find out, troubleshoot, learn new gear. Everything that comes out at NAB every year is already on the Facebook page, already being discussed, already has live videos of it being in use, what the LED screen looks like, what the menu system's like. It's it's pretty incredible. And, um, you know, and, uh, I don't know. It's just it's a crazy world. It's like I hate the technology. But then again, when I'm sitting, sitting there mixing at my desk and I'm able to troubleshoot that quickly um, or get sound devices on the phone or electrosonics, who's incredible out of California. They're incredible customer service. Um, I mean, you have something broken, you call them, they are going to take your phone call like an average, a normal human being and talk to you about what's going on. Hopefully the idea is that you have enough backups in your bag to where you don't need that component at that time and it's not an emergency. Um, but if you're in a pinch, man, Facebook's freelance page uh, could save your ass. It has definitely given me some inspiration through the time, you know, and, I, like I said, there's, you got to dilly dally through the crap, but um, you know, there's always high and mighty people and people with opinions that want to say something. But generally, there's a lot that can be learned through that. Excellent, that's a great source. Um, hey, now when you're on set, any lifesavers, audio lifesavers that you have that every sound man should have, like a tool or something special? Headphones. Definitely. <laughs> it's the most obvious, but it's, it's I mean, I, the bottom line is that even if you throw on the headphones and they're not plugged into anything, you're still going to fake most everybody out. So you can look like you're doing something, even if the shit's hit the fan. Uh, but in, in, all, in all seriousness, the, the number one thing that I've learned, and it's not in everybody's budget, and I've been fortunate um, at this point, is to have a backup recorder. Oh, Okay, damn. A backup, yeah, that's... a backup machine in the car, a backup something. Even if you're like for me, sometimes if I'm out with a big rig, and mine goes. At least I'm within 20 minutes. I can send a PA or have a family member or somebody drive the bag over to me. You know, your your earphones. Um, can you first of all, can you let us know the exact earphones that you have and you prefer to actually mix and all that? And then can you let us know maybe an average one that someone that can't spend that much might want to get. I, the, they're all the same. Honestly, the Sony, um, 7506s. They're like the industry standard. They're 99, 99. They're a hundred dollar headphones. I've never, I've used all kinds of fancy things and kind of gone back and forth. I mean, th- those are what I would use for on a budget to be completely closed in. Um, give you some ear protection and all that kind of stuff if you really want to spend some money then you would want to go up and get some some custom molded uh in ears that could really help you out 
But uh, I the, actually should get this. Those 99 ones, this sounds like a good price. I was thinking like uh, $300, $400, easy. No. No, you don't need to spend that much money. They're, they've got a nice flat signal, and they do just a fine job. They're very transparent. Great. Uh, hey, where can listeners reach out to you or uh, someone wants to hire you? What's the best place to reach you? Uh, best place to reach me is at my email, which is badblakesound at gmail.com. That's B-A-D-B-L-A-K-E-S-O-U-N-D at gmail.com. Um, I've got a temporary week ass website at badblakesound.com. And <clears throat> they can reach me always on my cell phone, which is area code 310-746-6742. And my Facebook page at Blake Allen Donabauer. Okay, Blake Allen Donabauer Facebook page. And that's Allen with A-L-L-Y-N. All right. Nice. All right, I have the hence last... The, oh. Hence the bad Blake. It's Blake Allen Donabauer. In case anybody's wondering, I'm not some kind of weirdo that gave myself a nickname. <laughs> bad Blake. Sound. <laughs> that's cool. I like it. Great. All right. Um, and I have just like one, one or two last questions before we wrap up. I know it's cool. I, I know how much time do we have left on the podcast? Cause I, I know your sister wants to get on here and, and speak her mind about something. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? <laughs> so she's giving me that look, you know, she's got that look. Oh, no, oh, oh, okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You don't want to talk. You don't want to talk. To <laughs> Actually, it's funny. No, I, I, I have to wrap it up soon. I'm going, I have a meeting in five minutes, but and I have to walk there and it takes maybe like 10 minutes to walk there. So, but it's okay. They can, they can wait. Cause I mentioned this. Dude, the casual, casually late to meetings is so stylish in Cali, man. <laughs> I tell you. It's just the long walk. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> What's one step that people can take today that actually can help them get to where they're going on that path of thriving in the entertainment industry? Boy, that's a great question. Could be anything. Boy, that's that's a stumper, Tony. That's a tough question. I mean, are you asking me what, what advice I would give somebody who's interested in doing that or what? Uh, what would you like the listeners to leave with today? If they could leave with one thing that they can today actually reflect on or if it's actually a step that they can do today, whether it's... Actually, you know what I'd like to leave... You know, people who are learning about the industry and, and new to it or don't maybe know much about it is um, the main thing that I take away from what I do every day is the amount of work that actually goes into everything that takes place. It is a very blue collar world. It is very hard work. It's a it's more on time in queue communication than like Wall Street. I mean, it is. Sometimes these walkie channels are going off like it's it's just it's insanity. Um, everything from costumers to makeup to hair to assistant directors to directors to producers to lights to grips to electricians, it is it's a lot that goes on every day, and it's a lot of sweat, and it's a lot of lifting, it's a lot of moving, sudden changes, it's a lot of adjustments. It's a lot of art. It's a lot of shadow and light. It's a lot that goes into every single piece that gets put together. And like, what I hope people understand is that there's a lot of jobs provided by this part of the economy. And I know that film comes off as a small blip in it. And a lot of people like to um, quote it as being Hollywood uh, in the media and everything. But but with the the advancement of the internet and the digital components that are out in this world right now, the films are being made, television is being made all over the world in every town. Uh, they could potentially be in your town next week shooting a reality TV show, and it could literally benefit your economy, your shop, your job. It could help uh, a lot of people, and, and, and that's what I take away from it is that there's so many people involved in it. To help. It's such a commutative, thankful community. Um, a lot of people think it's highbrow and, and, and there's a lot of ego and, and I've seen that with certain people, but the people that really love what they do and the grinders that are out there, like it's, it's a lot of work. So go see the movies, pay the money for it, get your Netflix su subscription, watch your Hulu, enjoy what you watch and like know that people have poured a lot into it. You know, it's a lot. 
And that's not even going. That's not even going into content writers creating the look. I mean, it, it, there's so much that goes into even the pitch to get it bought, to get the idea processed across the desk, to get a pitch shot is incredible processing, and it takes an incredible amount of belief in a product, in a vision, and it's 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 a ridiculous thing. And I I want to see it grow, and I want to see it be shot. I want to see things be made worldwide, and that's what you're seeing now with Netflix. You're seeing Ozark. You're seeing shot near my hometown in Fort Smith, Arkansas, right up on the Missouri line. You're seeing shows shot in New Orleans. You're seeing shows shot in Texas. You're seeing shows shot in Montana. Uh, I mean, they're they're shooting all over the place. I mean, even when you're based out of Atlanta, they're all over the country, all over North Carolina. Just I want to keep it keep it going. I want people to have jobs and have fun at what they do. And and honestly, we're a gaggle of um, People out there who want to just, you know, dress casually and work hard and be particular about what we do. And I think um, a lot of people fit into that category. And if you don't feel like you fit in or can't find your way, but you're a hard worker and you put your head down and go, man, th- this might be a great industry for you. And hopefully it's near you and you can find some work. I agree. Yeah, it's it's definitely can be very rewarding and creative, but a lot of work goes into it and, and it's it has a place in the world and so many people rely on entertainment um, for their savior at the end of their hard day. So oh, and, it's and something I'm, to be I'm part go, of. I'm, yeah. And I'm going beyond that too, because I do, because I'm fortunate enough to live where I live and make the connections I have. And I know you've got a meeting here, but I'm a time waster. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with the Pelicans and the saints here as professional sports teams here. You wouldn't believe the kind of work that goes into, you know, switching cameras and, and doing the walk on the courts in between timeouts and the amount of just work and technical think, thinking and foreseeing that goes into the to the way they do things. It's it it takes a it doesn't matter what you're working on, the entertainment stuff that if you go home and watch basketball or football at the end of the night, if you watch movies yeah. at the end of the night, or reality TV and you watch drag queens on E, mm-hmm. whatever your thing is, there is a bunch of people with their hair on fire, trying to do this right today, and that's and that's awesome. Yeah, that is. It's really it's it's really awesome, and it's really empowering. And and to sit here and like flip through my Cox channels and know that I have like two hundred and twenty one channels of things to watch, you know, and that's that many people making that many products. That's a great thing. Yeah, it's so much more than than people even in the industry think sometimes that's absolutely yeah the, 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 good way some of, the, some of these people that get their heads stuck up their butt and get really full of themselves um you know you can disappear in a heartbeat like i said earlier about if i got catch a lisp i might not get hired anymore i mean something could happen to you mark hamill got in a car wreck after star wars and i mean what if he didn't get a reoccurring role what if things change for you you know what mm-hmm. happens um you got to just keep putting your head down and going yeah Thank you so much. That's some great last words, my friend. Cool. All right. Well, I will hit the road. I want to thank you a second time and a third time for being on this podcast. Well, thank you for being my brother-in-law, Tony. I really appreciate it. I work hard at that. I know you do. I know you do. I I married your sister just to be close to you. That's what I was hoping. Uh, And it happened. Yeah. You knew it. All right. Well, dude, best of luck with your podcast and um, call me up sometime. Okay, love you guys. All right. Yeah, you too, buddy. Bye. Bye. I cannot wait to get a soundproof room one day. That is on my goal list. There's been airplanes and refrigerator motors flying around in the background. But nonetheless, that concludes this episode. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a thing or two about audio, sound on set, the beautiful complications, and the awesome gear that's involved. If you did like it, Please leave a review on iTunes or share this episode to a friend. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. For detailed sources and show notes for this episode, visit www.unfakeittillyoumakeit.com. Until next time, get up, get going, and get creative. <laughs>